Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar entitled Education by Design, the Impact of Artificial Intelligence on e-learning. So my name is Melissa Tupalaforge, I'm the Manager of Professional Development at CBIE and I'll be facilitating uh, and assisting the presenters today and taking care of all the technical aspects of the webinar. Hello everyone. Now, let me just get the audience view here. Okay. So just in speaking of technical uh, dimensions of the webinar, if uh, you'll see a control panel on your screen on the following slide, Carrie, if you don't mind flicking through the next one. So you should see the control panel. Okay, perfect. Okay, so you should see that control panel and on there you'll notice that there is um, you're automatically muted and so just for the sake of, uh, of hearing the presenters, uh, if you do have a question or a comment that you would like to share with everyone, feel free to raise your hand and I'll give you the microphone, I'll unmute your microphone. Now this can take, you know, seconds of delay so just uh, bear with me as I mute and unmute you. <clears throat> uh, and if you just want to raise your hand, click on the hand for the moment just so I can see that people are hearing me and are responding and can find that hand. Wonderful. Great. Uh, there is a handout for this presentation in a PDF document. So it's basically a PDF of the presentation. You'll find it under the handout tab. Now, if that doesn't open up for you, this sometimes happens depending on the browser you're using. I'll be sending the link to the Google Drive where you can find that. And so I'll be sending that in the, the chat in a few minutes time after I'm done the intro. <clears throat> and if you have any technical issues, uh, by all means, as soon as I'm done this introduction, I'll be able to assist you. Now you can just type it into the question box and I'll be able to respond to you directly in there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, before starting this presentation, I'd just like to take a moment to recognize that CBIE is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. We acknowledge and pay tribute to all Aboriginal people who live either in, in the Ottawa region or elsewhere in Canada and beyond. We honor their courage, uh, courageous leaders of yesterday, today and tomorrow. And so now I'll introduce uh, the webinar as well as the presenters. And so today, education by design uh, should be at the center of any online program, digging deeper into the emotional aspects of learners, whether they're young or old. And, and so this is the, the core of a good learning experience. Now, Hosni, uh, Zaluali is the CEO of Tech Adaptica, a company that creates live virtual campuses, allowing workers and students to keep learning and conduct uh, and connect using avatars and no matter what is happening in the world, hence, yeah, the current point in time. He also consults for Stanford uh, University, the online executive program in California. And our other presenter is Carrie Purcell. She's the Head of Strategy and Partnerships at Tech Adaptica. Her roots are in the classroom. Carrie started teaching online in 2006 and has been involved in international education ever since. She has a background in publishing, digital uh, transformation, and research with a focus on digital innovation and the future of learning. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Carrie and thereafter, Hosni. Thank you so much. So um, I, for, I'll speak for myself. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity today um, because I think it's such a relevant conversation right now. Uh, so thank you for that. We will run the session in two parts. And of course, I'll, I'll do this first portion here. And my focus will be um, just a brief introduction to online learning. Now, um, I laugh as I write that because I think that with the audience today, you're probably all experts in online learning, uh, but I hope to add a few points and particularly um, talk about what online education means in today's context. 
the second portion will be run by Hosni, and he will look more at the application of design thinking in online education, as well as taking a closer look at technology, AI, and motivation for rewards. So I, um, as I jump into this, I did a session on online learning just five weeks ago, not even five weeks ago, a month ago um, in New York. And the conversation was completely different, as you can imagine, than the conversation today. Um, don't know if you've seen this image before. It was the cover of The Economist a few weeks back. Um, we're, uh, we're dealing with a, a really different reality. And one of the main differences in the conversation around online learning is that, you know, a month ago, five weeks ago, there was a, a level of intentionality about everything. Um, educators were very carefully assessing traditional methods of education with new and digitally enhanced methods. Um, they were constructing blended and online courses using the, the newest and best tools. They were rethinking and redesigning curriculum to meet the very needs of their learners. And they were not doing this on a particularly tight timeline. Um, I don't need to tell you that today is different. <laughs> uh, currently, 87% of the, the student population globally is being affected by school closures. Um, educators, you know, probably many people on this conversation are moving their or have moved their in-person curriculum online and done that as quickly as overnight or over a weekend. Um, I thought that we'd start by just um, just getting on the same page in terms of a quick poll. So who who has taught online? Who is teaching online? And I'll get Melissa's help to run this poll. All right, everyone. I don't know, Carrie, can you see the poll pop up? People are voting at the moment, just so you know. Perfect. So we have 60% um, of people have voted thus far. And on the line today, we have uh, about 100 attendees. And so, okay. so I'll give another second until we reach at least 80%. There we go. And we'll close the poll and see the results. There we go. 35% said yes, 65% said no. Okay, really good to know. And the second question in the poll is, uh, well, how does that change today? So um, how many, uh, well, you can see the question there. Okay, so we're at about 60%. People are voting quickly. This is good. Okay, so if you haven't voted, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, there we go, we're at almost the same number and we'll share the results here. So 41% yes and almost 60% said no. Wow, okay. Thank you for sharing that. I thought, you know, the session was right after lunch and uh, I, I get a little bit of interactivity at the beginning, so um, not to kill you, but there's another poll coming. <laughs> um, so, so out of our group, it looks like a lot of the people that were teaching online are still teaching online, and a few have, have moved online. One thing that we think about when we're moving online is technology, old technology versus new technology, and that's basically what the next poll is going to ask you a little bit about. So I'll flip forward and Melissa will set up that poll for you. And Melissa, we can maybe do all three questions to get the results. Back to back, sure thing, yep. Yeah. And just while people are voting, you should be able to see, uh, just to reference back to that Google Drive with uh, the PDF of the PowerPoint, it's in the chat. So if, no, if someone doesn't see that there, just send me a quick message and I'll send it to you privately. So we're up to about 80% of votes, so we'll close that and share. There we go. Oh, wow, look at that. 99%, MP3, and 1%. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Right. I'll do the next one. Book versus ebook. Numbers are flowing up fast. We're at 50, 60, 70. 
There we go. Perfect. Thanks everyone for voting. There we go. So the results, oh, 60-40 split. Okay. 60 books. Yeah, that's great. Okay. And the last one, here we go. Human smile versus emoji. <laughs> And that's a quick one. There you go. So there we go. 95% versus 5%. There we go. <laughs> so the smile one, the human smile? The human smile, 95%. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'll, um, I'd love to have a, a discussion around this, but I'll just touch a, a couple of key points because I know we have a large group together. Um, I've run this poll before. I debated updating it because Today is different than it was a month ago, but uh, I'm glad that we kept the results the way they did because, you know, almost unanimously we agree that MP3s have improved a technology that, that many of us um, had, maybe still have the cassette. Uh, I 100% agree the MP3 is um, an improvement and it's and it's fully replaced the cassette, right? In fact, it's a couple of generations out. The book and the ebook is a really interesting example. So you guys came at, came down 60-40. Uh, every time that I do this poll, it's it's somewhere in the middle. It's it's somewhere in the 50s, the 60s. Um, so these results are are right in line with what uh, I've seen in the past. And um, we cannot say today that the ebook has replaced the book. It has not. Uh, there are advantages to both, but at the end of the day, it actually is considered pretty much the same technology. So we took a white page, we took the same content, we formatted it about the same way. And when I hear people talk about it uh, with, and I, I spent years in publishing, so I was um, paying a lot of attention to the the, the, the book when it came around, looking at the statistics, um, and, it, and it did not replace the book. But people like eBooks and they like eBooks because they have technology features like highlighting and zooming in and, looking up a dictionary really quickly. And people also love books because they have nostalgia, they like the feel, the smell, um, they like being able to see how far they are in their book in a physical context. You guys answer the question, so you have your reasons for it. Um, but these are two technologies that do almost the same thing and, and haven't replaced one another. With the third one, I know I cheated a little bit. A smile is is not a technology in in uh, literal terms, but um, but absolutely we can't replace that human smile. What the emoji can do is it can in a place where we don't or in a context where we aren't able to share that smile certainly give an indication of how we're feeling and also reach a really broad audience, right? We can reach tens of thousands of people with an emoji that we may not have the opportunity to do with our smile, and so. I'll flip ahead, bear with me for just a moment here while I update the slides. So one of the things that we think about when we look at technology and we look at old versus new technology, um, keeping in mind the ebook example where it may not actually replace the old technology, uh, one theory around this is looking at time and space. So does the technology change the time or the space uh, that the old technology worked within. So an emoji in that sense does change the space and the time uh, where a human smile can't. A human smile happens in a moment in a limited space and, um, and that emoji can, can last longer and go further. When we apply this to learning, to education, uh, you know, we think about online learning and that started with asynchronous learning. Now asynchronous learning is a, a completely different version of um, in-person learning. I don't need to explain that, but when we think about it in the context of time and place, it breaks all of those boundaries. So it does allow us to study anytime, anywhere, regardless of your time zone and your geography and regardless of your schedule or a, a school schedule. And those are huge benefits. It's a really, really, um, really important change that we've made in education. Now, that said, if we look at the statistics today, so if we look at MOOCs, for example, and these statistics are as recent as the beginning of the year, I'll pause on the, on the statistic for just a moment to say that a lot of people are talking about this point in time as being what will be the most research point in time over the next 20 years. Um, what I'm saying to you is what we knew up until now, and it's, and it's, it's gonna change looking forward, it's changing right now. But that said, 
currently, if we look at statistics around MOOCs, uh, so, so open online, massive open online courses, um, where it's completely asynchronous learning, the completion rates globally, and it changes region by region a little bit, uh, globally, the completion rates are 6%. So in other words, a 94% dropout rate. So we have this amazing technology that can reach people anytime, anywhere, and it's not working. Um, you know, there are, there are flaws, and some of those are things like motivation, structure, accountability. Um, also, the role of the teacher. I won't read this out loud because you can read it, but today more than ever, this is really relevant. So if we say that, that asynchronous uh, learning is not as effective as it could be, we can look at synchronous learning. And in this case, we might say that that's the solution. Um, synchronous learning does not solve the issue of time. So we do have to meet at the same time. We can only do something within a static period of time. And when it's over, it's over. So there is an absolute benefit to that. Um, and at the same time, it may not do everything. I think that today more than ever, fighting the feeling of isolation is incredibly important. And this, you know, this leads us into what I think we can start to think about today. So once we recover from this reactive panic mode that, that the last month has been, uh, maybe a crash course in, in online learning and new technologies, we can start to assess how effective what we came up with was, what worked, what didn't work, what we can improve, and start to use intentional design. Hasmi is going to talk a lot more about this, but just before I, I let him get into that part, I want to tell you how I met Hasmi. <laughs> so I was managing um, two research portfolios at George Brown College. One was the teaching and learning research portfolio, and one was the digital innovation portfolio. Last year, I ran about 30 research projects, most of which were focused on technology in education. I partnered with over 50 industry partners and probably hundreds of researchers, uh, and I spent over a million dollars in grant funds to support all of that. And it gave me this unique perspective on trends in education, particularly in the technology in education. Um, everything that we were working on was pre-commercial. It was forward thinking, uh, brand, brand new. Um, I popped up, I'm going to pop up a quick slide for you to show you just some of those key themes that, uh, that always come up. So people are thinking about mixed reality, VR, AR, uh, and this has made a, a very recent change where augmented reality used to, um, used to, to be something that if an, you had an in-class environment, you might use it outside of the class. Today, it's made a complete shift and we'll have to revisit what how we're going to use it, what it's going to turn into. Um, AI, a lot of conversations around micro credentials and blockchain is a, a really nice technology to use for micro credentials. And then, of course, a lot of these other buzzwords that, that we've heard, so gamification, simulations, adaptive learning, ind individualized learning, robots, and so on. Um, we're going to get into this uh, and probably the, the more exciting portion of the presentation. Um, so just so that you guys have the background, um, that's where I met Hosni. <laughs> um, Hosni was one of our, our, our industry partners. Um, he, uh, he, had, he had been teaching online at Stanford for years, so he had a background in this. And at the same time, he was running his own educational uh, company, as well as building and designing emerging technologies. Uh, that's what we started working on together, and I will let him tell you what he designed and came up with. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. So I think, um, yeah, here we go. I can show my screen. There we go. Uh, one second, guys. There we go. Can you guys see my screen? You guys all right? You can hear me fine? Great. All right, so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, about design. Thank you so much, Carrie, for all this uh, warm introduction and obviously all these data-driven analysis of the, um, of the educational world facing a major crisis right now. It's, it is a major crisis, unfortunately, um, but fortunately there's lights at the end of the tunnel. What I mean by that is the fact that it could be a blessing in disguise for education. 
we've been talking for the past 20 or 25 years about 21st century education, where in fact, when we think about education, the way we thought about it uh, right before the Industrial Revolution is that you have a village. In the village, you have a school or a building that we call school. This building be divided in different rooms. In these rooms, we're going to put chairs in rows, and someone's going to come in and tell us about measurements. So that's going to be math. And someone is going to tell us about human body, and that's going to be biology, or so on and so forth. So you can see really the correlation between a factory and the way educational system has been designed. And obviously, a lot of things have changed for the past decades, and education has been um, making great progress. However, the foundation is still here. When you take a look at other disciplines, like for instance, uh, communication, at that time, we were barely calling on the phone. You know, we started with um, writing on stones to writing on skin and then writing on paper. And then uh, the, uh, the, the Mars, you know, Mars and then phone and then uh, cell phones and then smartphones and now holograms. So you see how everything has moved fast in terms of communication. But in terms of uh, in terms of, uh, of education, we still have that old system that's basically holding us. So here's what happened: COVID-19. It is a very very interesting time for for education. The first phase we've seen is that first of all, this is the first world crisis where this COVID-19 doesn't see any frontiers, doesn't need any visa to cross borders. It just went and spread like globally very fast. So that's a very interesting phenomenon and nobody was ready for closing schools all over the world. But it happened. Now, the first reflex we've seen for the past few weeks, school boards, universities, corporations, let's put everything online, they said. Let's put all this content online because it's panic mode. We need to keep going. So we asked all these teachers to do whatever they can to put everything online, and the poor teachers tried to do their best with what they had. The most tech savvy have been able to manage some kind of a, their own educational design online, and the others are just you know, scratching their head, asking why haven't we been trained for this before? It is true. It is, after all, the 21st century education. We should have been ready 20 years ago, but we're not because the, the educational system we have unfortunately is not designed to fail fast and cheap it is designed to actually you know when i say fail fast and cheap it's purely silicon valley innovation mentality if you want innovation you need to have the frame of mind of failing fast and cheap why because a failure on top of a failure on top of a failure on top of a failure becomes a great success at the end of the day success is 99 percent failure but the educational system that we have doesn't let you fail, doesn't let them fail. You know, or students can fail, teachers can fail, of course, that's fine, and they can learn from their failures. But the Ministry of Education, let's just say, anywhere in the world is not meant to fail. Not fast and definitely not cheap. Every decision that they have to make is going to be um, very risk avert. And if it comes down to be a mistake, well, it's going to be a mistake that's going to cost a lot of money. So this system doesn't leave much room for innovation because it cannot fail and it cannot fail fast or cheap. I hope you're following me on, on, on this. But now we have this COVID-19, asking the teachers. That's the phase one. There are three phases. The first, first one, asking all the teachers and everyone to put everything online and let's see how it's going to go. And that's been around for maybe a little bit more than a month now. And on our side from Tech Adaptica, we were just looking at that from far away and we're like, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. And now everyone is con contacting us to say, hey, we have a big problem. Putting everything online apparently it doesn't work. Yes, it doesn't work. Why? Because you need to dig deeper into the emotional aspect of the learner and the teacher. It is a pool of pain points this whole emotional journey of i need the content whether i'm going to get it online or i'm going to record myself or i'm going to create it and then upload it and then deliver it and deploy it and then collect the data regarding who watched my video who did my assignment is full of pain points and not a lot of pleasure points and that's what we call the emotional journey that's why it's extremely hard for teachers to actually 
do it the way they do it in a classroom. And it has to become not a tech problem, but a design problem. On the student side, it is also extremely hard, as Kerry has explained. You have two choices, either synchronic or asynchronic. Both of them don't really work because we haven't really thought about the design of the entire learning experience. What's happening, what's happening with the COVID-19 right now? It's almost as if I was asking um, the city of New York to build a, an airport downtown New York with whatever they, they can find in their hands. So they started build, put a, putting a building together, not thinking about the design of departure should be on the top, uh, arrival should be at the bottom. They started putting like, you know, an emergency airport without really thinking about it. And this is even worse than that because it hasn't been done for the educational system. So we try to put things online and guess what? This, as Kerry has mentioned, is the most interest, interesting time in the history of education, I believe. Why? Because people are actually allowed to fail. And this is great. Let's make the teachers fail, the students fail, the Ministry of Education fail as much as possible. We will learn so much out of these failures. So that's really important. I might change it on my screen a little bit because obviously um, you guys are a little bit bored to see this first screen. Second thing I want to talk about is AI and how it's going to play. So we talked about this first phase of panic mode. The second phase is right now where people are starting to contact us and say, hey, how do we design an online program? Okay. I'm going to leave you with this. When I started facilitating courses, I thought about it this way. We have two ways of online platform. The platform that keeps you online and makes you learn as long as possible or keeps you as long as possible, and the other platforms. The value of your online program should be measured by what students do offline in real life. That's how you should measure the success of your online program. Not as much how long people spend on this program on their computers. We don't want an education that is mostly focused on keeping people on their device. We want to use the tools delivered by this device to do things in the real world, out there together. That's a huge, huge, huge distinction because so far, all, all the things that I've seen, all the designs of education that I've seen is, hey, we're going to build a learning management system and you'll see the growth, more people are using it, and you see the retention, how many times people are coming back to it and how long people are staying. And these are the measurements of the success of the online. And that's not good. I believe that education should be just a tool to do things together and make everybody's life a little bit better. Therefore, the value of your online program should be measured by what students end up doing together offline in real life. These are, this is a very important distinction. Phase three, after designing this, the phase three is going to be the post-traumatic stress, which is going to happen around July, August, where people are going to be, school boards and universities are going to be, all right, never again, we should be not ready for this kind of, for these kind of problems. So therefore, let's think about design as opposed to putting every, and using any type of technology. So let's go back to phase one, panic, put everything online. Phase two, Phase one is not working. Let's think about design. Let's call some, some experts here and there to think about designing a, a learning experience. Phase three, post-traumatic stress, they're going to be like, hey, let's move things forward and be prepared as much as we are prepared for an earthquake or a volcano. All right? So now, in parallel of that, what we're having is we have a COVID-19 problem, but now we have AI as well coming, the artificial intelligence. And if you think it's not going to impact education, well, you're up for a treat. <laughs> it is actually going to impact in education in a great way. And unfortunately, those who don't get on it will just be, um, will just be are more likely to be the victim of it. What is AI when you think about it? So to make this um, very quickly, so think about me as a student. So we were refugees from Africa. And we basically came uh, to France. You know, we, we came illegally to France. And for 18 years, uh, we stayed there. And eventually, I became, I became a European citizen. But during that time, I had to go to school. And when I had to go to school, I also had to work at the same time. So the students 
or the teachers were looking at me and they were, I remember at that time, they were telling my, pa my parents who didn't know how to speak French or English, they were telling them, well, if he becomes a plumber or a mechanic, that would be amazing, that would be a miracle. And the reason why the teachers couldn't really see beyond what they had to see is because you can't improve what you can't measure. AI, artificial intelligence, will help us measure pretty much everything about this child. His multiple intelligence at any time. What time does he learn best? What time is he, um, is he a little bit more asleep? Um, his level of cortisol, uh, face recognition, eye tracking, all that will be cross, will be some information that will be basically cross information that will be collected and analyzed live. That will provide the actual teacher with a mapping of his classroom of who's awake, who's not awake, who's stressed, who's not stressed, who's uh, learning, who's not learning, who, which, um, which um, um, predominant intelligence these students use compared to this one, who likes to work in groups uh, versus not in groups. That, on, that artificial intelligence will be the best teacher assistant ever created. It will not forget anything and it will not leave anything in uh, uh, for luck. It will basically, it will never get tired. It will always keep collecting and keep learning from these students. So this is where I feel like on top of the COVID-19, we have the AI that will push this education to a massive transformation. So now we talked a little bit about, um, about, about AI. And I don't want to scare you too much, but there is a dark side of AI. But nevertheless, you have a say. My point is, you have a say. Let's put it this way, guys. Um, when I think about it, how can I put that in a, in a diplomatic way? OK, so you, a, a basketball player from the Raptors, for instance, never goes to a game saying, I hope we will win today. Never does that. What it does is analyze the opponent, build a strategy, and go for it and work for it. The spectators that go and watch the game, they say, I hope we will win today. There's a big difference between the spectator approach and the player approach. The question is, do you want to be a spectator of this AI or do you want to be an actor of it? Instead of saying, I hope I'm not going to be uh, impacted by this AI, you have a say to transform the AI and make it beneficial to everyone. Say no to some things and say yes to other things despite the fear. Okay? So there's a lot of things that could be done, and I know that this uh, conference is not necessarily about AI. I will develop that at some other time, but remember, you have a say. You are not a spectator, but you are an actor to this whole thing. You are the player. All right. Design. We go back, going back to the design of the educational system. Okay, I'm just gonna put this down. Here we go. I said, la solution se cache dans l'empathie. Solutions is hidden in empathy, and this is really important. If you want to design an online learning program, whether it's a, it's an online program, courses, or it's a it's a device or it's an app you need to have a lot of empathy. Empathy for the learner, empathy for the teacher, empathy for all that. And basically, there we go. Think about this, potato peeler. The potato peeler has been created initially for people who had motricity issues, not for the masses, for motricity issues. Texting has been created initially for deaf people. So my point here is that if you want to design a great online program, design it for people who are with exceptionalities, disabled people or kids. If you do that, if the, if the exceptional people can, can make it work in a very fluid way or the kids can use it in a very fluid way, you know that your design is on point. It will be adopted by the masses. Think about it also in terms of um, your sequencing what to put first and what not to put first. I don't know if you guys ever heard about the IKEA effect. The IKEA effect, very quickly, I'll give you the, uh, it's actually a, a, an experiment that's his, that has been done at uh, the university where they separated people, IKEA customers in two. And uh, for a hundred of them, they said, hey, give me your phone number 
and here's what we're going to do we're going to come to your home and assemble all these things that you bought for you we're going to call you in two months and we'll see how it goes so that's what they did they called you know all these people that said hey we're going to come and assemble all your all your furniture they assembled it for them okay that's good for the second part for the second uh set of um of customers they said hey uh we're not going to assemble it but we're going to call you in two months okay they called both groups in two months the group that been assembled that we assembled uh the ikea furnitures for them and the, the the group that we haven't assembled anything for them and we said could you please sell us your furniture the first group that we basically assembled the furnitures for them they were willing to sell it at a cheaper price than they have bought it the other group that has to assemble everything by themselves on their own we said hey could you please now sell us your furniture first of all 50 percent of them said no and the second is the the, the other 50 percent who said yes wanted a way higher price than what they originally uh, expected from the first group why well by ikea's genius is that by making people assemble their own furnitures they now own it and they put a lot of value to it think about that in terms of creating an online program it's not about feeding students content like we did for the past three weeks but create an ikea effect where students really own that knowledge so food for thought go ahead with that okay the next thing i want to talk and probably the last thing is Within our platform that Kerry hopefully will show us, Kerry, what we have created, a, a virtual reality platform mixed with an, a learning management system. It's not necessarily a tech issue. It's more of a design problem. For us, we wanted to multiply the opportunities for people through the avatars to meet and talk with each other, okay? And for that, we used three types of, of rewards. And um, this is actually not my finding. It's a finding of um, Professor Baba Shiv uh, from Stanford University. So he decided that if you want to understand the human experience, you need to go back to the tribal human. And the tribal human works this way. He goes hunting. And every time he goes hunting, you have that dopamine hike, you know, dopamine spike that goes. Not necessarily because of the reward, but the expectation of the reward. He has a dopamine rush every time he sees a rabbit and he wants to catch that rabbit. Once he catches that rabbit, dopamine goes down. Therefore, he needs more. So he's going to get the second rabbit and the third rabbit. And that's what we call the reward of the hunt. The reward of the hunt on our platform is we want to give opportunities for students to learn and to collect points as much as they can. As many, as many points as possible, they're going to get collect learning and collect points. That's the hunt. The reward of the tribe is that when this tribal man comes back with five and six rabbits to the village, the village celebrates that and celebrates him or her. You see, same thing on our platform. When a student collected 10,000 points and 10,000 learning points, well, he's going to get new virtual shoes and new virtual shirts for his avatar. And the tribe, the community of learners, will say, whoa, how did you get these shoes and how did you get this shirt? So that's the reward of the tribe that basically boosts people to learn more, to want more. And the reward of the sale is then when, when that student receives a certificate at home without even knowing that he, he, he was supposed to, to do that. So that's the kind of reward system we're using to actually trigger the will to learn from a lot of students. All that needs to be carefully thought about while you're building or you're creating your online program. All right, so I'm going to stop here because otherwise we can go you know, very, very far. But remember you know, what we talk about. Phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one, panic. Phase two, design. Phase three, post-traumatic stress. Let's build something and make, make education move forward. The second thing we talked about, the impact of AI. AI will be the best assistant, a teacher assistant you've ever thought about. You can't improve what you can't measure. AI measures everything and will help you improve your teaching and obviously the design to work on the 21st century education is not a technology problem but more of a design problem thinking in terms of empathy empathy is the key for all of this empathy for the student empathy for the teacher and empathy also for the for the system that's my uh that's my two cents on this guys thank you
So great. Thank you, Carrie and Hosni. I'm just wondering now if we could uh, bring it back to a short discussion. We still have a few minutes. Let me just bring the screen back up here. Do we want to do a quick demo first, Hans? Up, 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 up. Can you hear me? I can yep. hear you. Yep. So we can do we can do it. Can you do the demo on your on your on your PC or are you working on a Mac? Because I have a very small Mac here. <laughs> so I can pull up a demo video. We can do a couple minutes of that. Does that work? Yep. Um, Let's do that. So we talked about what we've designed, but we really haven't shown it. So I think we should um, maybe yeah. send the link or share the link. You're right. Yeah, so I'll do it just a really short demo. I mean, it's a it's a video, so bear with us. Um, essentially, we're going to show you a tool that you've you've heard where we're coming from and how how think how we're thinking about things. Um, basically, we are looking at what's out there. And when I met Hosni, he was pushing the field of online education forward with new technology tools. So we were able through a research project to work on um, this piece of technology. We'll share that combines asynchronous learning with live synchronous learning. Uh, it doesn't shut off when the video is over or when the conference is over, so it promotes community, uh, multiplies live interactions, and it does that in both intentional ways, um, like, uh, like running a live class or a live event, but also in unintentional ways, the way that you might run into somebody on a campus or uh, meet somebody new who's taking the same course as you. Um, so that, those are some of the ideas behind it. And I will stop talking while this video um, tells you a little bit more and shows you a little bit more. Can you put it in, yeah, full screen, awesome. Thank you. Working on it. <laughs> So I don't think you can hear the um, the sound. No, yeah, okay. I'm going to give it uh, a little bit of a try here. So this is the virtual campus we built, guys. And you can basically, with your avatar, you can design the way you want. You can be a woman, a man. You can uh, wear the clothes you want. And you can move around through uh, the map. So to build this campus, we actually thought about, not necessarily about technology. Oh, yeah, we're waving to people. We can talk to each other, of course. You know, we have booths. We have classrooms. But we're not thinking about it just in terms of um, in terms of technology, but in terms of, again, about design. So the people who worked with us were actually people who do like city planning. And uh, the key here is to multiply the opportunities for people to interact with each other. On top of that, we also have a, a learning management system. So you click on that hat and you see at the bottom right corner, you're still on the campus, but on the top, you can learn. You have your courses, you have your recent actions, you have your tasks, you have your assignments in there. And you can basically watch any learning video while being con connected to the campus. So anyone can basically ask you some question and say, hey, we have a live conference on this and that, and leave this to go back to the live synchronic thing. So obviously, you have uh, the calendar. You can sync the calendar uh, with your own calendar. You have all the assignments. You have all the videos that you can watch while being still being connected to the virtual campus. That's very important so that we basically break that isolation issue that we have in, uh, in many, other, many other learning management systems. So uh, yeah, and then after that, the teacher can basically collect all the grades, uh, all the attendance, you know, how long people watch, did they answer all the questions. It's actually quite elaborate. It's pretty well done, um, not only on the student side, but also on the administrator side. So that's a pretty cool thing. So again, it's a learning management system combined with a virtual reality campus. There we go. Yeah, and if you basically using already Coursera or D2L or whatever, you can obviously, we can obviously integrate it in one click. So you have the virtual campus and you have your D2L or Blackboard that you're already using. Um, right now they're showing us a little bit the changes of your avatar, your calendar, you have your calendar, you can see your friend's calendar as well, whoever is going to what course, you can change uh, your appearance. Um, that's a very important one as well. And uh, again, you have small classrooms, bigger classrooms, you have uh, meeting rooms, you have uh, um, white boards, you know, you can draw on the board, you can uh, share your documents, you can, uh, the key here is that the learning doesn't necessarily happen just with the teacher, but it happens with other 
uh, the other learners as well, making people work in groups as opposed to making them learn alone with their computer. That's the key of the design of this uh, virtual world. You can change the appearance of the room. You can put like big tables, small small tables, um, and uh, yeah, that's what they. So this is the typical classroom. You have mats, you know, with a red mat, green mat, and obviously it's also isolated. You can also go on a private meeting with your own screen in the sky. So that's really cool as well, so that nobody can hear you. Uh, again. Um, yeah, if you want to know a little bit more about this, please go to a Tech Adaptica or adaptica.tech, and uh, you will see you will see more than uh, than you need to see. We're also doing a lot of um, there's a lot of talk being uh, being uh, being had in on the on the web right now about this this uh, this solution because you know um, it's being very popular because of the COVID-19. Uh, popular all over the world actually, not even in Canada, but uh, mostly in the uh, in the states europe uh, middle east uh, africa so any questions we hear uh carrie do you want to add anything thank you that was great hopefully that gives people at least a few visuals to to have a sense of how you can turn the theory into technology and what tools you can you can uh, have available to you yeah and if they want to see this video it's actually all over the web so you go to youtube or vimeo or you know, Adaptica Tech, and you have a whole walkthrough if you want to, it explains everything. Great, thank you, <clears throat> Carrie and Hosni, for that demo. That's awesome. I sent you guys a few questions. I don't know if you received them on your screen. Um, you can take a look at that. In the meantime, I'll just bring this slide back up here. And we could take a little few moments to just have a, a quick discussion. <clears throat> Did you get see those questions come up on the screen, Carrie? In the meantime, what I'll do is I'll invite a few of you to, uh, if anyone has a microphone available on their computer and would like to ask a question, please go ahead and raise your hand. I can go through the list and I can mm -hmm. uh, I can unmute you and you can and you can you know ask your question live uh, or you can type it into the question box uh, along with the others and uh, and we can respond to them so i'm awaiting any hands to come up <laughs> uh, in the meantime uh, i don't know if you guys want to answer to those first few questions that have come up so the first one uh, can you describe the empathy aspect as well as how it relates to student engagement so that was the first one from david so students it could be an adult student or a young student learning mathematics or learning a different language mm -hmm. can we clarify there and i will give you an example um, of, um, of empathy in uh, in the learning Sure, David, if you have a mic, you can just uh, come on the line. Uh, in the meantime here, I've got Emily. So Emily, um, I'm unmuting you at the moment and you can ask your question. Uh, hi there. Um, so it was really interesting to see uh, the platform that was created, um, uh, that, that was created by Adaptica, I think that, that's what it was called, and seeing that it was kind of simulating a live college type of setting. I was just wondering, what was the reason for um, the idea behind that? Was it to like kind of um, engage uh, students, engage learners, or was it something that you were speaking about regarding like the reward, the reward system that you were you were talking about, having an avatar, rewarding them with like uh, different outfits? Um, it was just really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually a mix of a lot of things. You see, when you take a look at the normal online program. Most of the time, especially the asynchronic, is that the student is alone watching a pre-recorded video from a teacher he's never met before. Or, you know, we wanted to break that and we go with the assumption that the learning can be done thanks to the teacher, but it can also be done thanks to working in groups with your peers. If you want to do that, you can use Zoom or you can use whatever. However, we also wanted to create a simulation world where it's kind of hard to uh, learn about nature or to learn about distances or learn about languages if you are just watching you know if you are just communicating through google hangout or zoom 
Why? Because imagine now we're using this uh, platform for French immersion students all over Canada. Imagine what they can learn through that to using the avatar. They can learn how to move, go right, go right, left, the names of the building, all the words that we would use if you were stuck downtown Paris. Mm. As opposed to being online, you know, seeing everybody's faces right now, you can't do that. You can't really simulate this kind of learning. So we put them in a position of simulation. That's the first thing. The second thing is we wanted to multiply the opportunities for people to interact with each other. So you take a look at the city planning of this entire campus. It's made that at anywhere you are, you can most you can see 99% of people on the campus. Right. It's almost like the reversed the reversed uh, concept of a Japanese garden. You know, with all, wherever you are in a Japanese garden, there's always something hidden. There's always something that you cannot see. Where in here, everywhere you are, you should see people. Therefore, you should interact with them. Therefore, you should learn from them, and you should teach them too, despite the teacher being around. So that's also a second thing. And then there's obviously the reward system because it's way easier to get points, rewards, leaderboards that dope, that cranks up you know your dopamine and wants you to learn more than being on a live communication like this. Okay, thank you. If anyone else would like to uh, raise uh, their hand to ask a question or, or provide a comment, then by all means. Uh, in the meantime, uh, did I hear back from David? David, yes. So David came back to us here with his uh, clarification. Um, I'm thinking about the relation in general between learner and teacher. Maybe you can detail um, you can detail young learners K to six or seven to 12 and university slash college students. And so the first part was, can you describe the empathy aspect as well as how it relates to student engagement, I guess, yeah. Okay, so most of the things that we do, we're actually surfing on an emotional wave that's going inside us. And these emotions can be translated in terms of hormones. If you are stressed, that would be the cortisol. If you are calm, that would be the serotonin. If you are agitated, that would be something else. If you are excited, that would be the dopamine, so on and so forth. There's a lot of misconception around what kind of emotions people are feeling. So the teacher designs an online program thinking about the students, but really thinking about himself being a student, which is, Slightly different. If you want to dig deeper into the emotional aspect of any student, whether it's elementary, secondary, or adult learner, there's no other way than putting aside all your assumptions and going and observing the students using your tool. That's basically the, and I know that you guys know that, it's the, the foundation of design thinking. But one thing is for sure, it's related to design thinking. You need to put aside all, all your assumptions and either observe, experiment yourself, or interrogate people or ask them questions. The combination of three is actually really good because right now, the entire educational system hasn't really done a lot of work on, hey, we're gonna knock on the student's door and be like a little mouse in the corner and watch him or her learn online. We haven't seen the Ministry of Education doing that. We haven't seen really the educational world doing that. We're gonna see it now, as Kerry has mentioned, there's a lot of studies that are gonna be seen because we desperately need to get inside people's lives, inside people's room, to actually look at how do they learn and make them express how do they feel at any moment of the learning journey. We wanna identify the pleasure points, and we want to identify the pain points. The key of the name of the game here is to try to cancel all the pain points and to try to increase all the pleasure points. If we do that, and it's not an easy job, if we do that, we will succeed. At Tech at Africa, we've been doing that for the past five years. We go to people's houses and say, hey kid, you're gonna take a look at this computer, open it, turn it on, 
and we're gonna literally, with the, extra, with the permission of the, of the parents, film you. And we're gonna ask you to voice what you feel. We basically try to identify where are the pain points at any time when this kid is online, when this kid is facing his computer. And you'd be surprised to see that what we think is a pain point is actually not a pain point, and what we think is not a pain point is actually a massive pain point. So I encourage everyone to do that, whether it's for elementary students, or secondary, or university, or even adult learners. But the same could be applied to the teachers, as a matter of fact. We've never really seen a study where people go to the teacher's home and take a look at, hey, how do you build this online course? Show me. And we've never really seen like the frustration, we've never seen the pain points or the pleasure points. We need to record all that and try to address it with an open heart. Thank you, Hasni. Uh, question here. What kind of activities can students partake in? Is there any chance of inappropriate behavior or cyberbullying? Mm -hmm. Hey, do you want to go in there? Do you want to? Um... Well, so just the last point. I think you should, you should really answer. <laughs> well, the very, you know, I um, spoke with the appeal board today. And so that the, the last part of that question just um, reminded me of this point. The, by creating that, uh, so one of the issues that people are facing right now is, you know, we're doing this video conferencing. Um, it lets people into your house, right? They're looking into your, into your house. They're hearing what's happening in the background. And um, depending on your student population and your school, it's an issue of privacy. So uh, this is not answering the full question, but just that last part of the question. Um, when you're in this virtual world as an avatar, you you, you know there you actually do have your privacy. Nobody's looking into your house. Um, the chat is uh, an option that you can do. You can do an audio chat, um, or you can turn it off and you can do a um, a typing chat. Um, so so there is that element which actually helps to protect the user. Um, I think I'll leave, I think I'll get, pause your opinion on cyberbullying. I have no examples of, uh, or concerns, but um, I'll let you speak to that piece. So for us, the, the teachers and the moderators of the campus. At this point right now, we have a lot of moderators, moderating a lot of students are, that are interacting on the live campus. And it's true that students are students. You know, you take a look at students in a park or students in a rec and uh, the uh, recreation, which is uh, the, uh, the, the schoolyard. They can be bullying people, you know, they can, that happens. The key here is really to address it and not to close the school. We're not gonna close the school just because someone at Risa has been bullied. No, we're gonna address the problem and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Well, same thing in the virtual world. There's always room to bully each other. There's always room to do it. But having safeguards and having uh, moderators being able to monitor that and basically work on the bullied, but also the bully, you know, because there's always a reason why a kid is bullying another, another kid. That's, I think, is the key. And that, again, that's also a learning, uh, a learning opportunity. But remember, we can find a lot of reason not to go online. We can find a lot of reason to say, no, we don't want to do that. However, as an old saying, you know, from Baghdad, um, it says, we're not, gonna, uh, we're not gonna ban drinking water because someone drowned in the river. It's really an interesting thing because so far we've been, again, you know, that's the, uh, there's a mentality in the Ministry of Education and in the education, not only in Canada, but everywhere in the world, we cannot fail. We cannot have bullying, we cannot mm -hmm. have this, we cannot have that. That's for sure, it's true, however, I believe that it's better to see it happening and address it as opposed to ban everything to everyone and stick to what we know. Um, and I'll just, yeah, I can just add that the technology portion, um, it does some really important things. So number one, it, it, it keeps a record for us. So if something is uh, uh, put in a chat box that, um, you know, isn't filtered out, it gets out there and it's not appropriate. Number one, we have a record of it. Number two, you can disable the chat out of the person who used it. Uh, number three, you can remove it. And likewise, if an, you know, if a, if a student controlling an avatar is doing something disruptive or inappropriate, you can also 
send that person out of the room. So the, the, um, the moderators and administrators have control to kick them out of the room, kick them out of the campus. Um, so, so there is that level of, of sort of tracking and accountability that we can correct on as well, uh, probably in a, a much faster and um, more precise way than we would be able to do in, um, in person. Um, so there's that, that point as well. So Carrie, thanks for clarifying that. So I'm <clears throat> sorry, I'm just jumping in here. So the moderators are on on are on your end, right? Yeah, that's right. We have um, we have um, university students who are in teacher college that actually um, do their practicum with us. We have um, retired teachers who are actually with us as well. But we also have the technology part of it. Some words you cannot write on yeah. the chat box. It will just ban it. We will know that it's been written by you, <laughs> yeah. but it will not appear to other to other students. So we can basically send a warning and say, "Hey, this kind of language is not appropriate for this kind of a campus. So please, no, don't do it." Okay, great. You can virtually suspend somebody if you need to. <laughs> yeah, very yeah. cool. Really cool. Yeah. Okay, we have a few. We have a lot of other uh, comments that have come in. A lot of very positive comments. Thank you. People enjoyed the session. Um, here we are. Some people want more information. So I don't know. I know that there's. Um, you, we can maybe if you guys want to send me the link, uh, or maybe Hosni, it's in your. Is it in your slide deck? The link to the uh, for more information to get in touch with you guys, or we can just basically Google Adaptica and. <laughs> <laughs> find more information online uh, but if there's any some people are asking if there's any other recommendations for online research articles on AI uh, someone mm. else is saying I'm really interested to learn more do you have any suggestions for the best way to keep learning about e-learning and design from here mm. uh, someone's uh, mentioned here she has a four-year-old daughter and she's using abc mouse which is using some the model that uh very much a model like yours and she says that it's really working well for her daughter mm. <clears throat> um so um, someone's here is wondering about the retention rate how good is the retention rate Sorry, I couldn't hear that. I, I heard the retention rate. Yeah, so retention rate for the students. I guess if they don't finish, they don't pass the course. <laughs> but is there any um, comments that you want to make on that in terms of keeping your learners active and, and engaged throughout the entire course? Yeah, so because we're working with a neuroscience aspect of design and trying to see what triggers dopamine for the student, what makes him go, what makes him stop, so on and so forth, the retention rate is absolutely amazing. Nothing that I've seen so far works as best as this. However, remember what I've said earlier, the value of your online program cannot be measured by this retention rate or by the growth rate, how many people use it. But what students end up doing together in real life or thinking together about a better world, a real world. So that's... Um, something that is great. We've achieved something amazing in terms of retention rate, but we try to keep in mind at all time that it's not the reflection of what an online program should be. The reflection is if we see people building a non-for-profit in their neighborhood that will help handicapped, uh, physically handicapped people to go up the stairs or to do this, that to me, and they say, hey, we learn it through the Adaptica platform. We did it together and this is how we connected that would be a, a validation that with what we designed is actually uh, is actually great. All right, thank Hosni. The another question here, what's the timeline for implementing and rolling out such a virtual campus and the the cost for setup and servicing? Well, it depends on uh, two things. So, we have two services. Um, the first one is carries um carries department it's about licensing the platform so that your teachers can use this platform to teach online put their courses online and so, and use the virtual platform to animate the whole thing that's one thing and Kerry will talk about that my portion because we've been working for so long with 40 school boards around canada france and united states what we do is we provide school boards with 
the campus, but also our own teachers to moderate the whole thing to build a community of learners. So the teachers give homework and their own teachers give homework and they come to our campus with our teachers, our facilitators to do this homework, to learn together, to have scavenger hunt and so on and so forth. That's a different system. Either way, either way, it doesn't take long to, uh, to, to make it happen. Just before the, uh, this, this conference, we had another school board asking for it to extend it from 9 a.m. all the way to 8 p.m. And if we send them the quote right now, they would probably be able to connect tomorrow. So this is on our end. Carrie, if you want to talk about the licensing part, that's uh, more your department. Sure, of course. So, um, so the licensing side is to have a private virtual campus that um, is, is customized to your needs. Um, so there's two pieces to that. There is um, looking at the existing design, adding branding, uh, you know, creating your virtual campus. That development is actually quite fast. Um, I won't put tech tech on the spot but i will say that 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 portion of the development can happen within a couple of weeks the other side is thinking about how you're going to use it what what curriculum you're putting up whether you already have existing online courses in an lms that you want to link or whether you're developing that from scratch or transferring it over that piece you know takes as long as it takes so to to really develop um online content that is solid, uh, does take a little while. Um, we like to, we're having conversations with programs now that are launching in September. We like to think of the summer as development time for, for both sides. So um, we, you know, that will be your time to put together content, give it to us to post, get everything ready to go. Um, a few months is ideal, but it depends, it depends what people have available and how prepared they are. We do have situations where uh, people have online content completely packaged, ready to go, and it's just a matter of, of in, um, uploading it, and that happens quite quickly. So hopefully that gives people a sense for it. Beyond that, you can customize as much as you want. Uh, so we've shown you, you, you have a sense for the aesthetic and the functionality. It can um, it can be expanded, it can be duplicated, it can be adjusted. So that's a separate piece, and that's as big and as long as as you know a client wants it to be. Great, thanks, Carrie. And I noticed that uh, both uh, Carrie and Hosni have um, um, added some links in the chat box uh, for some further information. And so we'll have to leave it at that for today since mm -hmm. we're already over time a little bit. So I'll just uh, do the wrap up here. Um, so I just want to thank you to Hosni and Kerry uh, for this really informative, interesting presentation. This is, the, you know, um, the way of the future when it comes to education and uh, what a what leaps and bounds compared to uh, what's uh, either currently being done or what has been done and so it's really interesting and I also want to thank all the participants for joining in today and for listening to this webinar we will have a quick, quick uh, survey it's about a five question survey once we close off this webinar and it's also available in the follow-up email just to see um, you know what you liked about the presentation and if there's there's more uh, information that, that CBIE could assist you with uh, in terms of future um, professional development opportunities. Um, there's a follow-up email that will, uh, that will come out about four hours after the end of this presentation. And so if you're interested in any other uh, archived uh, recordings from uh, CBIE, you can go to our website and there's a, a, a list of different webinars that have been recorded over the past, well, for the last, past long time, but more specifically in this last couple of weeks relevant to COVID-19 and dealing with this situation. And also our events page will allow you to see what's coming up in the very near future. We usually have uh, one in French and one in English uh, every week. And so thank you so much for your participation. Uh, Carrie Hosny, I don't know if you want to just say a few words of, uh, in closing. And if not, we will um, we'll close up. Hosny, Carrie, any final words? Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, everyone. Thank okay, you, guys. Great. Bye.
until next time, uh, take care and uh, stay safe. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah. And we look forward to seeing you um, involved in our next webinar. Take care. Bye-bye.